every single framework seems to be a failure. I mean, over a decade later, and we still use React. But to some extent, I think this is a bit of a misunderstanding of the goals of these frameworks. They might say they want to be used, and some legitimately aim to be the next React, but it is sort of like presidential candidates. Many of them don't want to be president, or they just don't have a reasonable path to actually get there, and they know that. So instead, they just want to sell a book, get a job in the cabinet, or more importantly, influence popular opinion in some way, usually as it relates to one or two specific positions. And frameworks and libraries oftentimes work the same way. Not necessarily the sell a book thing. I don't think there are many that just have a pure profit motive, but they introduce cool features and those features either get added to the language itself or more popular frameworks. That's not to say that they don't also solve specific problems for specific people. They usually do. It's just that I don't think the majority of them set out to dethrone React. I sort of think of the entire history of front-end development as only having three phases up until now. And yes, I know this is a huge oversimplification of a fairly complex history, but bear with me. The first phase I would identify was vanilla development. Initially, this was just HTML. Then eventually we started writing CSS and JavaScript. But as websites got more complex, this wasn't enough. And we entered phase two, which I would consider to be the jQuery era. jQuery was, and for that matter still is, a library that just made vanilla JavaScript easier to write, especially in these larger applications that we were starting to build. And then the third phase that came after this, that I think we're still in, is the React phase, or arguably the Angular plus React phase, as yes, Angular did come first and reached pretty substantial industry usage as well. Anyways, this idea of building components like we do in React was a pretty fundamentally different way of building websites. That's not to say that frameworks hadn't tried it before, but React and to some degree Angular certainly caught on more and they've lasted the test of time a lot better. Now, you might be saying, what about Vue and Svelte and all of these great frameworks that we have now? And for those of you that have been around a little bit longer, you might be asking about some older frameworks such is Backbone. And yes, all of these have been used. Vue in particular is actually much more frequently used in industry than I think a lot of people would actually guess, especially in a few particular regions and niches where it happens to be more popular. But I would still argue that none of them have reached all that substantial market saturation. React is still the most popular choice of major tech companies, and it's not really close. One way I like to think about this is what would I recommend to a beginner? And if you're just trying to learn something fun, do whatever you want. But if you want to actually become employable. I think it would be crazy for me not to recommend you learn React as a first library or framework, which to me is just an indicator of how dominant it really is in the industry. And frankly, this isn't even because React is better. In many instances, another framework would actually be more performant. And in some, another might lead to significantly simpler code. So why do they all use React? And the answer, as boring as it might sound, is simply that it's good enough. It's proven to work at the biggest scale, and there are more developers that know React than any other framework or library. This makes it a lot easier to hire a React developer than, say, a Svelte developer just because the talent pool is bigger. And oftentimes scaling a workforce is actually a bigger bottleneck than scaling the code base. React also comes with this massive open source ecosystem, and this makes it much easier to quickly build things. And there's also a bit of this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy here. It would be unusual for a tech company to switch from one framework to another, and we'll discuss why in a minute. But what this means is that most stick with with whatever technology they started with. And who writes the first code in a tech code base? The founders do. And where do those founders come from? Usually other tech companies. So they're going to use whatever tech they already know, which more than likely was React. So it just sort of reinforces this idea that React gets used in all of the new code bases. Okay, but then why don't more companies switch? If I told you switching to my framework would improve performance by 20%, why don't you do it? Well, there's a few problems with this. First of all, that would mean retraining your entire workforce in some new framework. Just the cost of that alone could outweigh the benefit of ever switching. There's also all the time needed to rewrite the code base, not to mention how big of a risk that would be to potentially create new bugs. And that time is probably just better spent building new features. You could also make an argument for only using the new framework for new work, but oftentimes that creates this fragmentation of who can work on what within the company as different people know the different frameworks. And it can also create compatibility issues when 
the code needs to actually work together. And in some cases, this could even mean that you don't get the benefits of this new framework because you're sort of only as good as the weakest link in your system, which would be the old framework. There can also be a fear of what happens if a framework stops being supported in a few years, which is just much less reasonable of a fear if you're using established options like React. So am I saying it is impossible for a new library or framework to succeed? No, of course not. But I think there's two avenues of success and the vast majority need to take the second avenue. So the first is just to convince companies to switch to your framework or to convince new ones to start using it. But that's a hard sales pitch to make. Unless you can show that you're like 10 times better, it's unlikely to actually happen. From a business perspective, it just usually won't make any sense. And if we think back to those eras of jQuery and React, I would argue that those were actually 10 times better experiences than we had before. They actually unlocked the ability to build things that we essentially otherwise couldn't, at least not in reasonable timeframes that would actually be viable from a business perspective. And I think eventually we will see another one of these big shifts. But for now, most frameworks fall into this category two of success. And that's for them to not actually catch on. What's interesting is that most libraries and frameworks aren't actually businesses. They don't need to grow users to make money because they are open source without any revenue anyways. As a result, I would argue that you can actually succeed by just being a proof of concept for some feature that gets adopted by the language itself or by more mainstream libraries like React. For example, many of you might be familiar with Prototype.js, which in 2005 added a bunch of functionality to JavaScript. For example, it extended arrays to include early versions of many methods that we just take for granted today, such as an early version of for each. Many features of libraries like jQuery, underscore, and Lodash that all intended to make JavaScript easier have also met the same fate of just being added to the language itself via the ECMAScript standard. On the React side, if you've been doing this as long as I have, you remember the days where nearly every component was a class. This was because functional components couldn't do things like have state before the creation of hooks. And you could argue that hooks were an inevitable change, and they probably were. But I would also argue that a big reason they exist and were pushed for so heavily is due to functional state management libraries such as Redux and RxJS that the community was just already using. We've also seen libraries like Inferno.js come out, whose goal was essentially to just be the more performant version of React. But I don't think the project was or is a failure. If anything, it probably had some influence in performance improvements made by React over the years. For example, projects like React Fiber, which was a complete overhaul of React's reconciliation engine with one of the main goals being improved performance, likely took some inspiration from Inferno. And whether it's one of the many libraries or frameworks that most of us have just never even tried, or it's a relatively popular one like Svelte or Vue, they all serve this purpose of essentially taking some idea and just putting it out there. And some of these frameworks are legitimately good and useful, and there are certain projects that I would actually recommend them for. And I love this idea of having more niche framework options rather than a single dominant player of React across every project and codebase ever. But even the ones that I just can't recommend to anybody for any purpose likely still served a purpose of being sort of a testing ground for new features, and they help push the overall web development ecosystem forward. And some of those features inevitably actually end up in these popular libraries like React, and they lead to larger impacts than that of those actually using the original framework. And at least in my mind, I think that's sort of a good thing. Sort of like this video here that the YouTube algorithm thinks you'll enjoy next.